This lecture discusses some criteria that can be used to recognize evolutionary trends in morphology or size or other traits. Uh, the field has advanced considerably since 19th century illustrations like Ernst Haeckel's Tree of Life here. And although the idea of progress in evolution doesn't really carry a lot of weight anymore, there's still a lot of interest in trying to relate apparent trends to specific select selective pressures. Um, but before you try to come up with explanations for why a particular evolutionary trend occurred, it's really important to determine if that trend is actually real, a directional shift, or if it just arises from random fluctuations. So evolutionary trends are commonly observed in the fossil record. For example, there's Cope's rule, uh, the observation that many fossil groups, especially vertebrates like Cope was working on, have small body size when they first appear, but evolve to become larger over time. Uh, the graph at the bottom shows the suture complexity of Paleozoic ammonoids. The right-hand graph shows examples of particular suture complexity values. Uh, you can see how the maximum and the mean or the average, and to some extent the minimum suture complexity all increase through time. But before we try to figure out reasons why that might have happened, the important question is, uh, was this trend actually driven by natural selection? Well, what other possibilities are there? One option is something called a random walk. So it's actually possible for unbiased random fluctuations. Unbiased just means that the value for size or complexity or whatever is equally likely to increase or to decrease. So it's possible for those types of unbiased fluctuations to produce an apparent trend. Uh, the example shown here at the bottom was a simulation uh, from a random walk. The histogram on the right hand side shows that the uh, simulated trait was equally likely to increase or decrease basically and the left shows the resulting time series which looks like a nice directional trend towards increasing values of our arbitrary trait. So another way to think about random walks is using an analogy with coin flipping. So normally you would expect to get around half heads and half tails when you flip coins. But if you flip enough coins, if you do it enough times, you'll get a run of five heads or ten heads or maybe even more in a row, for example. So although those unbiased random walks can produce short-term trends, they should revert to the average over the long term. However, few morphological traits are truly unbounded because there are often constraints or limits on what they can look like or how big they can be or whatever. For example, you know, an ammonite can't be much smaller than, say, a millimeter in size because it's got to contain things like eyes and a heart, and there's functional limitations on how small a heart can be and still actually do what it needs to do. So, th so this is something called a bounded random walk, and the classic example of a bounded random walk is this thing called the drunkard's walk. So imagine a drunk leaving a bar and staggering towards home. He follows a random walk, so he's equally likely to stagger to the left-hand side or to the right-hand side as he's walking along. However, there's a wall on the left, and so that means that if he staggers too much towards the left, he'll just bounce off the wall and, and keep going. So inevitably, the drunk will end up in the gutter. Inevitably, the stumbles will get too many right-hand stumbles in a row, and he'll fall off the edge of the street into the gutter. So with enough individuals or species the average or the maximum value in a bounded random walk will increase just because of random or passive fluctuations that are called diffusion away from this wall. So because size can't go below a certain value, just because of random ups and downs, some individuals will eventually randomly evolve to be big. So returning to our ammonoid example, was this a driven trend or could it have been a random walk? Well, there's certainly a bound Suture complexity, by its definition, can never go below 1, which is the value of a straight line. Um, so we will need to test this a bit more rigorously. So there's three tests that you can use to distinguish between random walks and true directional or driven trends. The first clue is the behavior of the minimum value. So average and maximum values will increase both in a bounded random walk and in a driven trend assuming that there's a lower bound on your random walk. So average and maximum tell you nothing about whether it's a random walk or a driven trend. But in a bounded random walk, 
different groups are going to be randomly fluctuating, so some are likely to be randomly close to our minimum bound at any given time. So this is the difference. In a driven trend, natural selection should favor increases in the trait, so all should increase, including the minimum. So if you look at the aminoids, the author has argued that the minimum value increased. To me, it looks kind of like stasis with some jumps at extinctions, but in any case, their argument that the minimum and the average and the maximum all increase is consistent with a driven trend because the minimum should not increase consistently in a random walk. The second difference between a random walk and a driven trend is in the ratio of increases to decreases. So a random walk, by definition, is characterized by increases and decreases occurring in roughly equal proportions. They're equally likely to happen. But a driven trend should have an excess of one type, either more increases than you would expect or more decreases than you would expect. So in the aminoid example, complexity was much more likely to increase than to decrease, both overall. In the left-hand graph, you see how 58% of the descendants in an ancestor-descendant pair are more complex and only 24% are less complex. And this holds if you look at different time periods. In every time period they looked at, complexity more consistently increased from an ancestor to a descendant than it did decrease. So the final test involves looking at the behavior of subclades. The reason you need to do this is because you can imagine two groups of aminoids, one that has simple sutures and one with complex sutures. If both are evolving by random walks, but if the more complex one is more common, it could appear that there's a driven trend. So to avoid those sort of potential artifacts, you need to look at the subclades as well. And in a true driven trend, the subclades should also show skewed, that means not symmetrical changes, more increases than decreases, for example. So in the aminoid example, that's exactly what they found. Um, all of the subclades that the authors looked at showed these skewed distributions with more, com more, in more increases in suture complexity than there were decreases. So you can ignore most of the giant table down at the bottom here, except for the rightmost column, which shows you that there are more increases, the first number, than there are decreases. So it's just the ratio of increases to decreases with stasis in parentheses. So the aminoids satisfy all three of these tests, the minimum value test, um, the ancestor descendant test, and the subclade test. So this does seem that there was some sort of selective pressure leading to more complex sutures through the Paleozoic. The aminoids are just one example, so the question we really want to know is are driven trends from some sort of directional natural selection really the common way in which evolution occurs? So the two lines, the vertical squiggly lines here, show you a typical random walk on the left um, versus a typical directional trend on, on the right. Well, the answer to our question, what is more common, seems to be that random walks are, are much more common, or at least that driven trends are quite rare. So Gene Hunt at the Smithsonian tested around 250 different data sets of morphological characteristics like size or shape. And he found that directional trends were the best explanation for only 5% of the, of the examples. Nearly half of the, the examples were best explained as a random walk, and around 45% were best described as stasis. Interestingly, it seems that size changes were more often random walks, whereas shape changes were more often stasis. So overall, the results from, from this study suggest that phyletic gradualism, or directional driven trends, are actually a pretty uncommon evolutionary mechanism. And this is what we already saw, or was already hinted at, with the fossil record um, when people first described the idea of punctuated equilibrium. And so it's actually that punctuated equilibrium with stasis or with random walks between the evolutionary punctuations that seems to be the dominant mode of evolution.